civic engagement and public service. We're happy so many of you can attend. I'm Dr. Rolando Garcia, the president of Broward College's South Campus and Partnership Centers, and I'm very excited to see everyone here today. Bienvenidos. We have an excellent event with some very special speakers, so let us jump right in and get started. As I look out and see all the smiling faces here today, I would like to recognize some of our friends who have joined us. Mario Cartaya, John Hart, Kingsley Gunn, retired Sunset Little, Angelo Castillo, Vice Mayor of Pembroke Pines, and happy birthday, Angelo. Maria Weeks, candidate for Broward Circuit Judge. Wes Hawkins, Dean, FAU. Anthony Abaco, Vice Provost for Broward Campuses of FAU. And if I missed anyone, please accept my humble apologies, but we welcome you just the same. Today's event is hosted by the Political Science Club and the Broward College Center for Civic Engagement. We know that a democracy thrives when its citizens are informed, engaged, and work together despite differences for the common good. Successful democracies protect freedoms and unalienable rights, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, to protect these rights, we must be engaged in respectful discourse and actively participate. I hope today's conversation drives home the importance of your participation in our democracy. Freedom isn't free, folks. Care. Get involved. Make a difference. We need you. The world needs you. Thank you for coming and supporting this event. Now I would like to bring on our college's uh, Vice President for Government Relations and our, our council, Greg Hale. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. Dr. Garcia uh, has been the president of this uh, beautiful campus for the last few years, and has done an incredible job. Uh, the focus that he's provided uh, for students has been really um, remarkable, and the opportunities that he continues to provide on this campus have been fantastic as well. So please give Dr. Garcia a round of applause. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, I serve as the College of General Counsel and Vice President for Public Policy and Government Affairs which involves me, uh, of course, handling the legal work and, and government affairs, but frankly, one of the most valuable components of the work that I get to do is I get to meet extraordinary people in the community, uh, just by way of community engagement, getting to know others, who frankly have an incredible passion for service, an incredible passion for our college and students. My minimal role here today is really uh, an opportunity to shed light on one of those individuals. His name is John Hart. I don't know if any of you have ever heard the name or mentioned it, but whether you realize it or not, there are always people out there who are here to serve students whose names you will never know. You will have the benefit of hearing from John Hart because he's helped create an opportunity that we are going to have today. John Hart has been serving this community for decades. Uh, he has also been serving this college for decades and will continue to do so. He has served as the chair of our foundation board and has been instrumental in raising resources to support scholarships and programs for our students. Yet you may have never heard of him. Uh, he's been a mayor in this community and yet you may have never heard of him. He had a wonderful idea of creating the Center for Civic Engagement for Broward College and yet you may have never heard of him. And now he is here today uh, and uh, has created this incredible opportunity to hear from one of uh, Florida's most incredible statesmen, yet you may have never heard of him. Uh, John Hart has been an incredible friend and teammate of this college and one of the best folks for this college that you may have never heard of. And so with that, I introduce you, John Hart. You've never heard of me. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll forget my name as soon as you leave, I'm sure. Uh, I have a, a very wonderful and special uh, opportunity this morning. Um, and I'm not going to take a lot of time because I want the time reserved for uh, the Senator's presentation and for your questions and answers. Uh, that's much more important. But I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that I've known uh, this incredible statesman for more than 30 years. Uh, as a, actually a legislator in the state first and then 
as a couple of terms as governor and three terms as senator. And uh, I, I hate to use the cliche because it is a cliche, but if you were to look for a photo of the poster child of statesmanship, it's Bob Graham. Uh, he has been remarkable in his pursuit of all of the things for all of the right reasons, from our savings of our Everglades to trying to make sure that our criminal justice systems are improved, uh, to ensuring that the nation's security is not second-guessed or ever sacrificed. He's had a history of 38 years and many books to go along with it of service to our state and our nation. And I am thrilled to be able to introduce to you a dear friend, Senator Bob Graham. Good morning. John, thank you for those kind remarks. It has been a wonderful 30-year friendship that we have shared, uh, and I hope that it will be one that will have many more years. Uh, I'm here today at uh, the invitation of the Broward College South Campus to talk about where we are as citizens in the oldest uh, and most distinguished democracy in the history of the world. The responsibility for the continuation of all of the privileges and freedoms that that has given to us is now ours, and particularly yours, as your generation uh, will be going through the, the process of preparing and then beginning to function uh, as the dominant leadership citizens for America. This is a sad time. Just a week plus one day ago, a uh, tragedy occurred not far from here, and I understand that uh, there are a number of students who are in a dual enrollment program between uh, Stone and Douglas uh, and this South Campus, and uh, in fact that one of those students is not with us today because of that tragedy. I'd like to ask if we could begin with a moment of condolence for those who have lost their lives and uh, a longer period uh, of appreciation for those who have said enough is enough. Uh, I am not going to take it anymore uh, and have gotten actively involved in order to avoid yet another tragedy such as the one that we suffered on Valentine's Day of this year. So please join me in moment of reflection, condolence, uh, and hope for the future. Amen. I hope that this uh, is a beginning point of a longer term relationship uh, with Broward College, and specifically this South Campus. Uh, I have been fortunate to be involved in a program at the University of Florida, you modestly called the Bob Graham Center for Public Service. Uh, last week we had a summit where over a hundred students from across the state, including some uh, from this campus, came to the University of Florida and spent uh, a weekend. Uh, I hope they enjoyed themselves, but it was serious work. Uh, as they thought through uh, what were some of the issues facing uh, the environment of Florida, uh, meeting with experts in a variety of areas, and then suggesting a number of proposals which will be presented uh, over the next few months uh, to the appropriate decision makers, whether it's a county commission or a, a water management district or the state legislature. And just to say what young people can do uh, at a previous similar, what we call Summit for the Future, uh, the students selected voting as the issue they wanted to concentrate on. And one of the sub-issues under that was the fact that uh, Florida made it difficult to both register to vote uh, and if you changed your address, which students do frequently, uh, to make the necessary alterations uh, in your voter information. And they wanted to do something about that. Uh, and they selected, among
among the range of options to allow uh, in Florida the use of computer uh, online registration and modification of your voter information so that you could do it from home at your own computer. Uh, that was adopted by the summit of the future. It was written into legislative form. The students found legislators who were interested in that subject and convinced them to introduce the bill. They went before the legislature and advocated uh, for online voter registration. And as of January 1st, 2018, you and every other Floridian can use that method uh, to see that your voter registration information uh, is accurate and timely. Uh, that's an example of what a group of people exactly like you who have a goal and a, the tenacity to carry it through can accomplish. Uh, I hope that the students at uh, Douglas uh, will have the same success in a much more difficult uh, area of gun rights and mental health and the whole array of subjects that are involved in the slaughter that occurred uh, at their school. Uh, we wish them well. And this is a, a fortuitous time to have this surge of young voter interest uh, in their democracy because there are many voices saying that our democracy is in serious trouble. Uh, a leading writer for the New York Times, David Brooks, recently wrote an opinion uh, article with the headline, How Democracies Perish, citing the ways in which democracies uh, go into decline and revert back into an authoritarian government. The, the Economist magazine every year rates about 160 countries around the world on the state of their democracy. In every edition up until this year, the United States was ranked in the first group of countries. We had the fullest democracy. We're now in group two, we're in the second group, which they call, we're a near democracy. Uh, and the main factor uh, in our demotion is the fact that citizens have lost such confidence uh, in their political institutions. Uh, people don't think that the, the state legislature, the U.S. Congress, the president, the governor, officials uh, are representing their uh, interests. There has been a schism between the voters uh, and their elected officials. Another article appeared in the New Yorker magazine in August of last year, and it had the scary headline of, Is America Headed to a New Civil War? Uh, a group of uh, distinguished political scientists were assembled uh, to talk about that question. And this occurred several weeks before the events at Charlottesville, and the consensus of the experts was by a 35% margin that there would be a civil war in the United States, not Lee versus Graham, but more like a thousand Charlottesvilles occurring at the same time, and that it would occur within the next 30 years in the period of your prime of adulthood. Another similar group of experts gathered at Yale to discuss the state of democracy. And the headline there is that 20 of America's top political scientists gathered to discuss our democracy. They are scared. Quote, if current trends continue for another 20 or 30 years, democracy will be toast. And then finally, from the Boston Globe, an article headlined, A Toxic Election is Damaging the Seed Corn of Democracy, Young Voters. You being exposed to an election as toxic as the one that we went through in 2016, many cases have been found to have lost confidence uh, in democracy and uh, whether 
uh, it is a form of government that they can continue to support. These headlines are supported by facts. Uh, most Americans today have little knowledge of their national, their state, or their local government. A survey taken just last year, only 26% of Americans could name the three branches of government. There's been a declining acceptance of the responsibilities of citizenship, most evident in voting. Uh, in 2016, the voter turnout was 55.7% in the United States in a presidential election year. Where do you think that ranked us among the other major democracies of the world? Well, the answer of the 35 developed democracies on the planet, we're 28th in terms of the percentage of our people who feel it's important enough to participate in the election of the chief executive of our democracy. And in local elections, it's even worse. Uh, since the beginning of this century, the average turnout in the 144 largest metropolitan areas in America has dropped from almost 27% to 21%. And the, uh, another evidence of the citizenship responsibility declining, one of the ways in which Americans have typically involved themselves in their community has been through organizations, whether it's a League of Women Voters, or a Kiwanis Club, or whatever organization that had as its objective promoting the civic good. Uh, today, only 6% of Americans belong to any such organization, and in Florida, it's less than 4%. Now, why has this decline occurred? Well, I, part of it is an international phenomenon. Around the world, countries that were thought to be uh, either emerging democracies or uh, stable democracies uh, have returned to authoritarianism. Places uh, like Venezuela, like Turkey, like the Philippines, some 15 in all uh, have reverted from democracy to authoritarian government. Uh, so the, the decline that we see in this country is eerily similar to the steps that led to those countries' ultimate rejection of democracy. Uh, I think a second reason is that Americans are uh, not uh, convinced, uh, and I'm afraid to say they have reason not to be convinced, that democracy is the best means of solving their problem. Uh, and to use the problem that is before us today, the tragic loss of life by uh, gun murders. Uh, Americans could reach the judgment that our government at the state and the national level have been dealing with this issue now for more than two decades, and instead of progress, uh, we seem to be accelerating the problem. The number of instances that have occurred and the extent of the slaughter has been increasing, and rather than passing policies that would tend to reduce the amount of that slaughter, what's been happening, in fact, is to make it even easier for a person like that deranged 19-year-old to get access to a military weapon uh, and kill 17 people. Uh, but I think that one of the most fundamental reasons why our democracy is in decline is that beginning in the 1970s, we stopped teaching civics in most of our schools in America. Uh, to speak from my own personal experience, I graduated from Miami Senior High School in 1955. Uh, I had taken three one-year courses in civics between the seventh grade and the twelfth grade. My wife and I are fortunate to have 11 grandchildren, nine of whom have graduated from high school. Most of those nine uh, had no civics. Uh, a few had one semester. That's the degree in one family over three generations that the teaching of what it means to be a citizen in a democracy 
has declined. I am so pleased that South Broward uh, has taken up the challenge of returning civics uh, to the life of this institution. Uh, I look forward to meeting with you and talking further about uh, what is happening here uh, and that it could be a role model for other uh, higher education institutions in terms of treating civics as an important part of our democracy, I think maybe the salvation of our democracy uh, and that uh, you are the beneficiaries today and all Americans will be the beneficiaries uh, in the future. Uh, the, uh, I, I am not only a strong believer in returning civics, but returning a new form of civics. And I'll tell you a little personal trip that I took a number of years ago. When I was in the Florida State Senate, I was chairman of the Education Committee. Uh, we decided that we would hold our hearings before the legislative session, uh, not in a uh, committee meeting room in Tallahassee, but rather in schools across the state. And on this particular day, we were at Wolfson Senior High School in Jacksonville. Uh, we also provided in the agenda for each one of these hearings an opportunity for students to come and talk about what issues they had that they thought the legislature should deal with. And that this, on this particular morning at Wolfson, we had a large number of students and they all were, uh, wanted to talk about the same issue. Probably one of the oldest and most common issues in American public education. Bad food in the cafeteria. Uh, now, I wasn't surprised that they were concerned because frankly, although I had a great experience at Miami High, those stingeries, uh, food wasn't very good in the cafeteria there either. What did surprise me was that they had come to the state senate to talk about the bad food. So I asked them, are we the first people that you talked to about this? And they said, no, you're actually the third. Well, I felt better about that until I asked who was one and two. Number one was the mayor of Jacksonville, Hans Tanzler. And he said that he agreed the food was probably bad, but that it wasn't in his responsibility. So disappointed, they go to number two, Dale Carson, who was the sheriff of Duval County. And he said, again, the food's probably bad, but it's not criminal, so it wasn't his responsibility. So they ended up with, at the state legislature. A few weeks later, I was talking with a group of civics teachers in Miami, and I told the story about what had happened at Wolfson High School. And I said, there must be something wrong with the teaching of civics that these students, many of whom were seniors and were about to graduate, were going to leave high school with the feeling that the mayor, the sheriff, or the state legislature was where you would go for cold pizza on Friday. And uh, one of the teachers got up and said, uh, Senator Graham, I'm mad as hell. I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you because you politicians are always telling teachers how to do their work better and you don't know what you're talking about. And the only way to find out is to actually go in the classroom and see what it's like. Deal with indifferent students who didn't do their homework, with parents who won't show up for a parent-teacher conference, with an administration that's overly bureaucratic, and with all those laws that you pass that we've got delivered. So I said, sure, I'd be glad to do it. Now, I thought she was had in mind a couple of hours on Tuesday afternoon. She called me back uh, shortly thereafter with the uh, true assignment. She said, you're to come to Carroll City Senior High School. It's not too far from where we are. It's in North Day. Uh, on the day after Labor Day, first day of school, uh, report to room 208, and you will be teaching 12th grade civics for the next 18 weeks. Well, that was a little more than I had uh, quite thought about. Uh, one of the uh, smarter things I did was to find a young social science teacher at Carroll City, uh, 
uh, who shared my ideas about what was needed to teach civics, uh, and he agreed to, to co-teach this uh, with me. So we spent a good bit of the summer working on a curriculum, uh, and the title of our course was, What Does a Citizen Need to Know to Make Democracy Work for Them? What does a citizen need to know to make democracy work for them? Well, I think those students who were up in Tallahassee yesterday, and I guess they're there today, and we're coming back over the weekend, uh, they have answered that question. They have mastered the skills of how do you first diagnose the problem, develop a solution, uh, eloquently advocate both face to face and through the media on behalf of your position. Uh, now they're going to be tested as to their persistence, their staying power, because one of the things in, uh, in life and in politics is that change is not easy. And frequently you get knocked down a few times before you're successful. Do you have the grit to get up and keep going? I think those kids at Douglas have got what it takes. But uh, we taught that uh, course, uh, and it was transformational for me. I did, in fact, learn a lot about uh, a modern high school. Uh, I learned the difference between learning by doing and learning by uh, reading about something in a textbook or having somebody yak at you, as I'm doing today. Uh, and the, the basic course that we taught required the students uh, in mastering the skills of effective citizenship, such as uh, how do you uh, how do you organize your uh, group to be most effective? Uh, how do you convince the media that they should pay attention to what you're doing? How do you get other people to join you? How do you form coalitions? Those are examples of some of the skills of effective citizenship. Uh, I later uh, taught that same course when I was a senior fellow at the Kennedy School to a group of Harvard undergraduates. And as I truthfully, but kind of like to say, that the Harvard undergraduates were only slightly more civically illiterate than the uh, students that I taught at Carroll City. Uh, and after that experience, I was encouraged to write the, uh, the curriculum what does it take to make democracy respond in a book? And it's called America, the Owner's Manual. Uh, each chapter is devoted to a different skill of citizenship. Each chapter starts with a case study where a person, much like you, uh, people of all backgrounds, uh, saw a problem or a missed opportunity and said, we are not just going to think about it. We're going to do something. And they use the skills of effective citizenship in order to accomplish a very important objective. Uh, I hope that uh, as you proceed through your uh, better understanding of what it means to be a citizen in a democracy, uh, that you will learn the skills of effective citizenship uh, and put them to practice. I think that civics is not theoretical. Civics is like playing the piano. You can't learn to play the piano, and I will testify I tried for two or three years when I was like six years old, six, seven, eight, and described myself as a failure, uh, gave it up. But you can't learn the piano without actually playing the piano. In my judgment, you cannot learn the skills of citizenship without actually doing the skills of citizenship. Uh, the um, we're in a tumultuous time where I think as a society we're being challenged. Can we reverse this decline uh, in democracy? Can we do it by not only preparing the generations that are older than you uh, who did not have access uh, to civics education since it was not taught for such a, a long period, uh, and particularly those of you who are still in your uh, educating period uh, to be active, effective uh, citizens 
uh, who have learned by application the skills of being effective. I think that what is happening in Tallahassee this week is the most important thing for America probably for this year. Youth are leading a demonstration, applying their learned skills and passions, and they are doing it in a way that is going to fundamentally change American democracy. Now the question is, will we listen? for the kids. Thank you. Thank you, and I understand that there are some uh, questions. Yes. Did you want to do it? Yeah. Uh, even get to sit down and answer the question. Isn't it great, this beautiful facility? Good afternoon, my name is Victoria Brower. I'm a professor on our central campus. But I'd really like to thank Dr. Nieves, who is head of the Social Sciences Behavioral Department here at South Campus, Professor Hubert over here, and the Political Science Group of South Campus for hosting this incredible event. Let's give them a applause. the questions. If you want to go ahead and pass them down, um, PSG members will be collecting them and passing them forward to ask Senator Graham. So thank you and welcome Senator Graham again. We really appreciate your presence here, especially at this time. Um, one thing is, um, I actually participated, our students did go up uh, to the University of Florida when the CRC was meeting and uh, did walk away with some uh, winning proposals, so that was a real exciting time. And I understand as well, Dr. Hawkins is here from FAU, along with John Hart, preparing civic engagement on that campus, on our campus. So young people, the opportunity is there for you to make a change. If you listen to people who have experience, what a great, great thing. And um, Senator Graham has written a book, he doesn't know I'm saying all this, I, it's called America, the Owner's Manual. And I went through it, and I've been reading through it, and it's an incredible reference on if you say, well, that's great for you, Senator Graham, but I'm just a college student. How do I get involved? So can you explain a little bit about your heart through this book, Senator? Well, let me do it uh, through an example. Yes, sir. That course that I taught at Carroll City, uh, we divided this class into groups of three. I think that was done purposefully because one of the techniques of a modern uh, relationship is how effectively can you work in a small group. Uh, we asked the groups of three to select a problem or a missed opportunity with this understanding that one third of their final grade was going to be based on what they were able to do about the problem. This is not writing a paper or giving a class talk. We were going to set where is the problem on the first day of the semester, 18 weeks later, where is it? And a third of your grade will depend on how far the needle has moved. That caused the students to select topics that were local. And I think that's another important point. Uh, my granddaughter this week happens to be participating uh, in a uh, model United Nations. I, that's great. She'll learn something about uh, the United Nations, about international relations. Frankly, I wish she were participating in a model school board or a model city council because that's where decisions are going to be made that are much more likely to affect her life than at the United Nations. But that's just my, my presence. Well, one group of students selected as their problem to solve. Uh, Carroll City uh, had uh, a private water and sewer company. And there had been a, uh, it had a reputation of not providing very good water, that the water in Carroll City didn't taste as good as most water in South Florida does. So they wanted to find out if there was, was this just a, a myth, a rumor, or were there any facts to it? So the first thing that uh, we did was ask the chemistry department at Carroll City 
if they would give these students a crash course in how do you collect samples of water in a manner that will be convincing to the ultimate decision maker that you have scientifically uh, usable material. They, they received this training and then they went out, collected dozens and dozens of little bottles of water from the appropriate number of sites over the appropriate period of time. And when they had fulfilled all of the requirements, they then asked the question, who are we going to give all these bottles to? Well, our government is complicated. We live in a federalist system where there's a national government, state government, a local government, and then a, a lot of special districts that have specific responsibilities. Uh, it's not easy to figure out who the decision maker is. Uh, who do you think, anybody have a suggestion as to who you think, if we were in Broward County, who would you go to if you wanted to uh, have the water that you consumed at your house tested to see if it was fit to drink? Well, the answer is, it's the county health officer uh, who is a state-appointed official. So they uh, took their bottles down to the county health officer, pushed them across the table, and he said, I'll run them through our analysis. And you know what? They found that the water was bad uh, and started sending directives to the municipal, to the utility to, to take corrective action. Well, when those students showed up at the end of 18 weeks, they got a very good grade for the one third. But that's the kind of thing that these are 17 year old high school students uh, who figured this out and made a significant impact on the day-to-day -day life of the people who live in Carroll City. Uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, you can, not only can do, I'd say as a member of a democracy, you have a responsibility uh, to do. Thank you very much. You know, at the end of the Constitutional Convention, legend says that a little girl went up to Benjamin Franklin and asked, so what kind of government did you give us? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. How can young people keep a republic? Uh, and that challenge that uh, Benjamin Franklin gave to the, to the young girl now, well over 200 years ago, still rings true. Each generation of American is asked the question, uh, you live in a democracy, uh, are you able to keep it and pass it on uh, to future generations? And we've, we've been close to losing it uh, a few times uh, over our long history, and, but each generation has stepped forward uh, and in most cases not only preserved democracy, but enhanced democracy uh, as a a generation which I don't think has done a, a very good job of our handling our democracy, I don't want to go to the grave feeling that I was part of the group that uh, was there when things collapsed. So I'm depending on you to keep it going for at least a few more years. Uh, but uh, I think that the most important thing you can do uh, is to prepare yourselves just like you would prepare yourself for higher education, which you're doing now, uh, for completion of your AA, and then maybe a, a bachelor's, and then maybe a graduate or professional degree. You're preparing yourself for a career. You should also be preparing yourself for citizenship. And among other things, uh, that means learning about the community in which you live, learning uh, the skills of effective citizenship and putting that learning into practice. Don't say, well, I'm only 19 years old. Nobody can expect me to change the water in Carroll City. Hell no, you can change the water in Carroll City uh, and all the other things that will make the community uh, in which you live a better place. Excellent. Yeah, so yeah, the subtitle of the book is You Can Fight City Hall and Win. And Mr. Vice Mayor, first, happy birthday. And 
I'm sorry that we took you on. Oh, yeah. Okay, next question says, what would you say to those that do not believe in a system that won't change? Well, change is, uh, if, you, if you try not to change, then you are doomed to extinction. Mm -hmm. the, the creatures of the earth that have survived have been the ones that were able, resilient enough uh, to constantly be adapting uh, to a changing set of circumstances in which they are going to live. The dinosaurs didn't make that transition, and other than using them to fill up our car with gasoline, they've left the, uh, the scene. Uh, so uh, change is a requirement, which means that you've got to be sensitive to the world in which you're living uh, and realize its changes. Uh, as an example, uh, I would assume most of you are probably uh, in your late teens or early 20s, uh, the change that's occurred since you were born, most dramatically, uh, in the forms of communication. Uh, I, when, when I went to the United States Senate in 1987, wasn't that long ago, uh, each member of the Senate was, was given three computers that they could use. We had something like 60 employees in my office fighting to use the three computer. Uh, but it was still a question mark as to whether computers were just a fad or whether they were really going to amount to something. I'd say they amounted to something. Uh, and uh, institutions, including the U.S. Senate, had to adapt to the fact that now everybody needs to have a computer in order to carry out their responsibility. So understanding a changing environment, uh, either adapting to it, or if you find the changes to be uh, negative, trying to reverse the changes, are part of being a survivor uh, in a constantly uh, changing world. All right. This one says, how do we as citizens or what do we do when we as citizens are vocal about a special issue and officials in the government don't listen? When politicians don't listen, many people lose hope. How do we keep those engaged? The last chapter uh, in the book is called, You Won, You Lost, What Do You Do Now? Politics is never permanent. There are no victories that have then become absolute. Uh, it's a constant uh, process of uh, issue, challenge, resolution, then there's a new issue, challenge, and resolution. Uh, I say that there are three basic qualities necessary for effective citizenship. You have to have a subject or subjects that you're passionate about. The students at Douglas are a good example of, of citizens who are passionate. Second, you've got to be persistent. As I indicated in my remarks, most things don't happen uh, in a straight line. There are ebbs and flows. You win, you lose, but you keep moving towards your objective. And then third, you have to have skills to play the game. Uh, you can't just throw up your arms and scream and think that you're going to make a difference. You've got to understand. As an example, if, and I would like very much to meet with some of the students at Douglas and talk about where they go from here, because um, I think the, the challenges they're going to have now are going to be uh, persistence. Uh, a year from now, Valentine's Day 2019, will, will this effort have been sustained? Uh, second, They've got to grow the group. Uh, I would personally suggest they try to get as many other high schools in Florida uh, to organize around this issue of their own safety uh, and what is the state doing to avoid their high school being the next uh, Douglas. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, the importance of not 
giving up uh, to stay the course until you accomplish the uh, objective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who was your role model, and do you suggest that young people have some type of role model or mentor? I think it's good to have people that uh, you uh, look up to and uh, uh, can uh, sometimes seek out for their advice. My, uh, my Florida political role model was a former governor named Leroy Collins, who was governor during a very difficult period of desegregation. Florida came through that period much better than most southern states. Some states, they shut down the schools or closed down colleges and universities in order to try to avoid uh, integration. Uh, Florida didn't never succumb to that, and it was in large part due to Leroy Collins' uh, leadership. Um, when I was elected the governor, but before I had inaugurated it, I spent a lot of time with him, and he was very influential on my uh, uh, period as governor. Just one of the things, he was a great believer that the single most important thing that a governor does is appoint judges, because they're going to serve a longer period than you're going to serve as governor. Uh, and they set an ethical standard for the uh, community. Uh, and I took that very much to heart. I hope I lived up to his uh, standards. Great. What do you think of the current state of the Democratic Party and the future of it? I think both parties are in trouble. Um, we, there was a period in the uh, uh, 1850s, just before the Civil War, when essentially both of the political parties uh, collapsed. And one of them actually went out. There had been a party called the Whig Party from the very beginning of the nation. Uh, and uh, it uh, lost out and the Republican Party was formed in the late 1850s, then with Abraham Lincoln becoming its leader and elect president in uh, 1860 uh, to replace the Whigs. And the Democrats went through a very rocky period. So, what we're experiencing today is not uh, historically the first time we've been through this. Uh, I personally believe that the parties have gotten away from the people. Uh, and I could put a lot of uh, responsibility of this on the amount of money that it takes to run for office and what that is doing to the willingness of people who live a life more like the uh, typical Floridian offering themselves for office. Uh, just personally, I, uh, uh, when I ran for governor in 1978, uh, I spent about six million dollars in the primary. There was a first and second primary and then the general election. So that was over three elections. Uh, it's estimated that the campaign for governor that's being run for 2018 and if I could say this without violating rules, I happen to be that my oldest daughter is a candidate from government. Uh, but that some candidates could spend as much as 75 to 100 million dollars. Well, if you have to spend that kind of money to get elected, that means that the pool of people who will, can and will offer themselves to be governor gets to be pretty small. And I think not representative of the people. So, uh, I think one of the things that need to be dealt with is to try to reduce the influence of money in politics. And with that, we'll get a more representative group of people seeking and getting elected to office. And they'll do a better job of representing the interest of the people. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask a question. You mentioned four women that were influential. How important is family support systems to people who want to run for office or make a change? It's critical. I don't think anybody uh, who has a family could seek uh, a uh, political office and then serve without the full support of that family. It's just too, uh, too consuming, uh, too demanding. And they're going to be, if you make a decision that 
people don't like and you will make those decisions inevitably. Your family is going to take uh, some of the, the, the criticism uh, and the, you know, the people come up to them in public and say, what in the hell did your husband uh, do uh, yesterday? Uh, and they've got to be uh, uh, deep, as deeply committed as you are. And I might say I was uh, very lucky. I have a wonderful wife who just celebrated our 59th wedding anniversary. Right. Uh, we have uh, four daughters and as I mentioned, 11 grandchildren. And one of the things that we've uh, done as a group is when my daughter was uh, elected to Congress in 2014 on the uh, week before the election, we all went to her congressional district and spent seven days uh, campaigning as a group for uh, her. So if any, we ran into anybody who said, oh, I don't know, I have made up my mind. After those 11 grandchildren worked him over, he made up his mind. I was at University of Florida, your beautiful wife gave me this gorgeous picture. She carries these around of your beautiful grandchildren and your yeah. children. So it seems that family is very important to you. Um, what would you say to college students who want to seek office? For example, when you were going to um, hire somebody for your staff, let's say, and uh, it could be press or it could be um, media or it could be um, issues, what are the main things, let's say three things that you were looking for to hire somebody? The two questions aren't, don't have quite the same answer. The first answer, the question about a person thinking about running for office. Uh, my first recommendation is what you're doing, and that is getting a good education. Uh, and I would say try to get as broad an education as you can, uh, because although you can't be an expert in everything, you need to have enough of an education that for instance, if the issue that you're dealing with on Monday is an education issue, the issue on Tuesday is uh, water quality, uh, the issue on Wednesday is transportation, and on down the road, if you have a general education, that will equip you to be able to master a constantly changing set of issues, uh, and then good judgment try to reach a, a decision as to what's the most beneficial thing to do. The second thing that I would recommend is don't go into politics immediately after you leave college. I've known a lot of people whose career path was they were uh, a president of the student body uh, at their college. Uh, two years after they graduated, they ran for the city council. Uh, Four years later, they were elected mayor. Six years later, they were elected to the Congress. And now they're 40 years old, and they've been in the Congress uh, for 12 years. And they've got to make a hard vote. And they know that if they know that the right vote is yes, but that it's going to be politically put them in danger, that they won't get reelected. And they also recognize that they uh, don't know to do anything other than to do politics because that's been their whole life. Uh, and that's when you get in a compromising situation where almost for reasons of self-protection, you'll vote against what you think is the public interest in order to avoid making yourself vulnerable to defeat. Uh, so having that independence, uh, and that independence is both economic that you know that there's something you can do that will support you and your family at whatever level of lifestyle you want. But maybe even more difficult is something that's, that meets your psychological needs. Uh, why do baseball players stay around two or three years after they should have retired? Why do actors and actresses still keep seeking parts when they're well beyond the the height of their career. It's the fact that you get addicted to the applause. You just can't feel 
you could live without uh, having that constant reinforcement of your value. And the same thing happens to politicians. They overstay their length of service because they can't uh, accept the idea that they won't be a celebrity anymore. Uh, so get something that will meet your psychic needs so you can say, I can give up this damn job of being in Congress and I'll be able to support myself and I'll be happy. Uh, then you can be independent. Well, I really want to commend you all your students uh, from here from South Campus and again the staff that has put this together, our video and tech people back there working hard. Thank you, Senator Graham, for your time. Thank you for your excellent question. Um, Mr. Hart now has some parting words. Yes, sir. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so what, what uh, we've been just privileged to witness uh, is uh, the intellect, the insight, uh, the forthrightness uh, of uh, Senator Graham. Uh, one of the things that I would like you to, to take away, if you don't mind, is to think very carefully about what Senator just said. Uh, there is an old adage uh, that if you find something you love to do, uh, you'll never work another day in your life. Think about that for your civic involvement, okay? Thank you.